Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on your time zone. Welcome to the 2024 International Lightning Safety Day meeting. Uh, my name is Daila Zhang, an assistant research scientist at the University of Maryland. Uh, International Lightning Safety Day is an annual uh, virtual event dedicated to reducing lightning hazards and promoting global lightning safety. Um, each year, uh, we have scientists and engineers and experts from Asia, Europe, Africa, and Americas gathered to discuss lightning mitigation strategies, educational programs, and our um, challenges and um, cooperations. We extend our gratitude to the African Centers for Lightning and Electromagnetics Networks, the South Asian Lightning Network, and the U.S. National Lightning Safety Council for their invaluable support. Special thanks to Keisha Jane for her work on the flyer. Um, today's meeting will run for four hours with a total of 17 talks and a panel discussion. Each speaker, except for the keynote, will have 10 minutes for their presentation and Q&A. Given our global audience spanning 15 time zones uh, with some participants in the late night and some participants in the early morning, we kindly ask every uh, speaker and attendee to adhere to the schedule. Moderators will provide a two minute warning before each session concludes. Questions can be submitted via Zoom chat or YouTube chat. Both will be monitored throughout. And thank you for all, all, all of you to participate um, in the ILSD this year to support uh, lightning medication. Uh, now, without further ado, let me introduce um, Professor Chandima Gomes, who will de deliver the opening remarks and introduce our keynote speaker. Professor Chandima Gomes is a distinguished professor at the University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, South Africa, and the director of the Center of Excellence in High Voltage Engineering. He's a globally recognized um, consultant and trainer in lightning protection, earthing, and energy, ranked among the top 2% of researchers worldwide by Center University for the past five years. Please proceed with the opening remarks, Professor Gomes. Okay, thank you very much, Dali, for your nice introduction. And uh, welcome all of you. Uh, very familiar names, uh, what I can see in the screen. And uh, today we are marking uh, an important milestone of a long journey. The journey of safeguarding human beings from the wrath of nature comes in the name of lightning. And uh, the lightning safety uh, is a subject that uh, people have been addressing for the last century or so. But the actual scientific lightning safety measures, uh, especially that is away from the standard lightning protection systems, uh, lightning safety uh, has been in the focal point of few scientists in the 1960s, if I remember a name, Goldie, uh, in his book, the famous Goldie book, Bruce and Goldie and Goldie books, they have mentioned about lightning safety, how to do it scientifically. And then in the 80s, uh, several American scientists and activists started lightning safety. And I'm proud to say that one of them, one of the key figures of that era is with us today, very active, Professor Marianne Cooper. And then a new era of lightning safety started exactly 13 years ago in 2011 in Kathmandu. And this Kathmandu event is very significant when it comes to the, the journey of lightning safety. And uh, with the leadership of uh, Prof. Uh, uh, <coughs> Sri Ram Sharma, and also uh, another prominent figure, Prof. Arun Kulshetra, 
the director general of non-aligned uh, scientific uh, movement, uh, the Center of Science and Technology in New Delhi, uh, took the leadership in originating or, or rather establishing worldwide networks on lightning safety, a platform for internationally recognized activists to work together. And then uh, we had a series of events sponsored by the Non-Aligned Movement Science and Technology Center uh, in few countries, in Uganda, in Zambia, and again in Nepal. And among these events, we, uh, we had another very important achievement. Uh, that is the uh, naming of an International Lightning Safety Day, uh, which occurred or which took place uh, in, uh, in Lusaka, Zambia, under the leadership of uh, Mrs. Uh, Foster Lubazi, uh, who is very active in Zambia at the moment. Uh, we came up with the, the, the concept of Lightning, International Lightning Safety Day, and then many parties started promoting it. Tried, even today we are trying to get it into the UNESCO calendar as an internationally recognized day. And uh, I should not forget another, another name who actually proposed it at a personal meeting. Dr. Munir Rahman from Bangladesh. I don't know whether Munir is here with us today. And he played a big role uh, in coming up with this concept. Then all together, we accepted that. And it was, uh, uh, it, it was uh, generally accepted as the day to commemorate uh, those who died from lightning and also uh, to take steps not to repeat the same tragedies in the world in the future. And uh, just to tell you the history of this day, it is the day in 2011, if I remember correctly, uh, 18 students were killed by a single lightning in Uganda, and their teacher was critically injured. Uh, earlier it was said that uh, the teacher was also dead, but later found that uh, uh, he was uh, uh, not succumbed to his uh, wounds. And uh, so that uh, we all determined that this type of tragedies will not repeat in this world again. And uh, several parts of the world started working towards uh, reducing the lightning injuries, uh, trying to take whatever the precautionary measures that they can take uh, to curb lightning deaths. And uh, among them, uh, I cannot uh, refrain from telling few uh, names and few institutes. The Center of Excellence of Lightning Protection in Malaysia, headed by Prof. Zainal Kadir. Then the team in Colombia, headed by uh, Prof. Francisco Roman. And there were few very young uh, scientists and activists there uh, who play big roles like Nobeto uh, and Daniel. And then under Prof. Marianne Cooper's leadership, Africa is coming up with uh, various centers, then Foster Lubazi, and in South Africa, uh, Ken Nixon, Ryan Blumenthal, Hugh Hunt, Marina Schumann, all of us are getting together to go towards a world free of lightning 
injuries and lightning damage. So this is the path that we are walking and we try our level best to make sure that whatever we promote is within the peripherals of scientifically proven and scientifically accepted norms uh, so that we strongly uh, reject those who recommend or prescribe uh, methodologies and uh, technologies uh, which are beyond the accepted scientific norms. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for your participation at this event. And thank you very much for all of you to actively engage in lightning safety uh, education, lightning safety research, lightning safety promotion. And uh, one last word I, I would like to tell you is that we scientists can do a lot to improve the present day knowledge and technologies of uh, lightning safety and protection. However, unless the media is going to support us, the information that we collect, we innovate, we find will not go to the general public. Therefore, I really appreciate what the media has done so far and also invite those who are not involved with us, please come and join our efforts. Let's have a better world for the people. Thank you very much. Daily over to you. Announcement that the facility will be the team from Antenet, led by the founding director, Professor Emerita Mary Ann Cooper, a retired professor of emergency medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago. The visit aims to update the education minister on their work in Uganda and to discuss their proposed collaboration with the Ministry of Education and Sports to mitigate lightning hazards in schools. If these people are trying to save our children, at least initially, and we are charging them for giving us a service, let's begin there, if they can give them that tax free. Thank you. Then we will start talking about how we can uh, facilitate their, their campaign if you like, yes. to educate our people about how they can save themselves. So we'll try to do everything we can do uh, before you leave. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll continue to move step by step. But at least let's start with Revenue Authority and then we'll see. We'll discuss how we can support a whole campaign which we can also be involved it's a real yeah. honor and pleasure that you should bring us this program that really will save the lives of our children and our people. So I can't thank you enough, and I'm honored to meet you. And thank you on behalf of the country, Uganda, and on behalf of the Ministry of Education. According to Acclimate, lightning is the most common weather threat to life global often encounter daily. Research indicates that Uganda experiences 2 million lightning strikes annually, with the majority of reported victims being school children as they are gathered in large groups in school buildings that are not adequately protected from lightning. Many schools in Uganda currently use outdated, untested technology for lightning protection, which often fails to meet standards and protect students as evidenced by students' fatalities across the country. We've been serving the country of Uganda for 10 years, Aquanet has been. We've mostly been protecting schools, but I hope for the next 10 years, we're aiming at doing public education. When we go out to these districts where we've protected the schools and meet, we meet with the district officials, they beg us for education. They say, tell us what we can do. Tell us so that we can educate our people, so that we can protect our children. 
And so that's what we're hoping to do. And that's why we're meeting with you, Mama. Through donations and partnerships, Aklenet has protected various schools in Uganda, including Runyanya Primary School in Chirandongo, Rockview in Tororo, Balebek SS in Lamu, Magoyo P7 School in Yumbe, Sean Primary School in Chankwanzi, Kurujio Primary School in Soro, and Rambe Primary School in Vishen. Reporting for UBC. Chandima, can you introduce our uh, keynote speaker? Sure, I will. I hope that you, you all can hear me. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Heiki uh, Pajola. Heiki is working as a scientific officer at the World Meteorological Organization Space Program. Before his career at WMO, he worked at UMETSAT as a remote sensing scientist for Meteostat third generation. Uh, uh, the generation satellite mission and its lightning image instrument development. Before you know Sat, he worked for a decade in the field of weather radars and lightning detection systems in private sector at Wiesel. He holds masters in meteorology from the University of Helsinki, Finland where he started his career working at Finnish Meteorological Institute as a research scientist. And he works in the field of remote sensing at that time. So Heike is a prominent figure in the field of remote sensing and meteorology. So please uh, welcome Heike Pajola. Heike, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for your for your nice uh, introduction and uh, greetings from Geneva. And uh, at the same time, with uh, this uh, group being part of this meeting, it feels uh, a bit like home, uh, returning back home. Because as uh, as he explained, I have um, um, background in in lightning detection uh, with Vaisala and also with weather radars, etc. So. But now I'm I'm with WMO uh, working as a scientific officer. Part of my work is still related to lightning detection. You will see that in a minute in my presentation. And uh, um, just for your curiosity, it has been quite unstable here. We are located in Geneva and uh, in the Alps region. There has been thunderstorms almost daily basis and uh, also, some uh, with some heavy rain and uh, and uh, and the flooding, and uh, even some some people are missing uh, because of that. Uh, first, I want to give you a little bit background about the WMO, so World Meteorological Organization. So it's a UN specialized agency uh, on weather, climate, and water. Uh, we have uh, one hundred ninety three member states, so almost all countries in the world. Our headquarters is here in Geneva. We are around 300 people here. And uh, it's the second oldest UN agency since um, 1873 already. And uh, as you know, WMO work, um, it very much uh, based, um, it, it, it's based on, on the expert teams. So, so we are coordinating really uh, many expert teams, more than 200,000 national experts from meteorological and hydrological services and academia, and also from private sector. So we have a framework that the private sector can be involved uh, also in our expert teams. And uh, and that's a huge advantage that we can have uh, also the, the knowledge from the private sector and uh, and uh, and they, they perspective that uh, to which direction things should be developed. And uh, also WMO is a co-founder and the host agency of IPCC, 
and uh, co-founder of the UNF Triple uh, C, and um, WMO uh, Secretary General is also UN Climate Principal. And uh, there you see the it's it's very well known about the uh, about the climate um, monitoring and uh, and uh, and uh, IPCC especially IPCC report. But actually, the, the main thing is, of course, the observations, uh, including the lightning. And here you see on the left hand side, you see the figure of the all, all kinds of observation components in the in the WMO um, integrated uh, uh, observing network, uh, which uh, we are here uh, regulating and, and maintaining. So this is very much the framework we are working with so uh first of course uh to 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 have any forecast or or or, or warning you need you need to have observations so that is uh, really a key and uh, that is also where WMO is putting lots of effort um my work is here in the infrastructure department where all these um different components of the global observing system uh are are, are managed and uh, um that's the, the the home of data collection and analysis and uh, then um, uh from there you need you need of course modeling for prediction and that is also what um, WMO is coordinating so we have those global uh, um um modeling uh, centers uh, together with some uh, some uh, uh, limited area modeling activities as well and then uh, to follow on uh, post processing and automatic production of the of of some uh, some uh, uh, products from the from the models and then uh, of course you need meteorologists and the weather services to forecast uh, interpretation and uh, and the decision making which is the which is the key thing that what should be the decision made uh, based on the on the on the forecasts or, or, or warnings and then dissemination of the products and the services to users that's the key thing so if the if it does not um reach the the user it's useless and that is of course the the, the issue the last mile is 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 issue in many many countries that we have uh, we have really products and uh, all the data available but it never never reaches the user and then of course you need to understand what that that does mean so this is the WMO framework and what is the WMO's role in this? So we set standards, uh, we, we, we build capacity, so we put a lot of effort to, to, to knowledge transfer for the, from the develop, uh, developed countries to the developing countries, informing advice, uh, influence uh, in different sectors, and uh, identify user requirements, especially for the related to observations that what kind of observation needs are there and uh, and uh, what are the requirements and uh, that, that's what we put then in, uh, in our manuals and uh, and the guiding the the work of uh, national um, meteorological and hydrological institutes to fulfill those commitments and my work um, is is focusing on on the WMO space program so we are we are only four people here uh, who are working with uh, with the space based observations so we we cover kind of these um these uh, roles uh, related to satellite um uh, related to space based measurements uh then uh, a little bit about the data policy so that is really a key uh, document uh, in the WMO framework so we really promote the the open um uh open access and uh, free free and restricted exchange of of any data and um, as you may know, uh, uh, WMO data, data policy was renewed a couple of years ago. So now there is only one data policy for any any uh, any uh, uh, observations um, defined. So it was replacing the the resolution forty for feather, twenty five for hydrology, and sixty for climate. And uh, it adopts the the policy for on the international exchange of Earth system data. And the, their WMO commits itself to broadening and enhancing the free and, and unrestricted international exchange of Earth system data. So, also the WMO vision and uh, and uh, strategy is now more than weather and uh, and the uh, and the hydrology. So we, we it's a more Earth system approach now. So we also try to cover other areas than 
than especially other areas than weather. So it's single overreaching data policy resolution uh, for all system observations, monitoring, prediction, and services. Then about the main topic of my talk uh, is the early warning for all. And uh, and we, we really um, have now this UN initiative, which is the um, um, uh, announced by by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres um, in, in 2022, and uh, it is the to ensure that every person on Earth is protected by early warning system within five years. So as you see, it's pretty ambitious um, uh, target uh, to have that. Uh, so. Uh, in five years to cover all the countries, uh, it's, a, it's a huge um, challenge. And the WMO is, of course, playing an important role on, in this. And uh, uh, where it is coming from, that uh, there are huge gaps in the early warning system. So uh, only 65% of the world's population, uh, mainly uh, in OECD countries are, are covered by the early warning system. And in the least developed countries, coverage is less than 50%. And if you look at the small island, island developing states, the coverage is, is only about 40%. Uh, if you look at the Africa, early warning system coverage is only about 45%. And then overall, only half of the world's countries report having enough capacity to alert uh, their citizens in the case of um, hazardous weather conditions. So there is uh, lots of work to do to be um, to have a have a good coverage, indeed. And uh, this task is actually defined between different organizations. So it has uh, four pillars, and uh, WMO is one of them. So first of all, there is a pillar for disaster risk knowledge and management, and that, that is led by the UNDRR. So it's a United Office of Disaster Risk Reduction. And that is about the uh, that to, to ensure that, that there is an access to reliable and understandable uh, uh, risk information, science, and expertise. And then there is a... Um, Pillar two, which is um, detection, observations, and monitoring, and uh, also analysis and forecasting, and that's by that is led by WMO, and that is of course to to ensure that there is a robust forecast and monitoring systems, uh, policies to support optimization and sustainability of hazards monitoring and early warning systems. So this is very much related to the to the to the capabilities, uh, measuring capabilities. And then there is um, um, pillar three, which is really crucial. So this is about the uh, uh, about the dissemination and communications, and so to ensure that early warning are are effectively and timely disseminated and reaching the, the user. So this is defined uh, led by the ITU, International Telecommunication Union. And then uh, a fourth pillar is the is the preparedness uh, and, and response capabilities. And that is led by the International Federation of Red Cross. And uh, it's about the um, early action to, to prepare for and respond to incoming disasters uh, uh, upon receiving warnings. So it's it's also so also very crucial uh, part. So uh, with all these pillars, uh, we, 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 we try to improve and, uh, and complete the, the task by UN that uh, that there would be a better um, coverage of the of the early warning service services globally. Um, so what are the WMO, WMO efforts? Then uh, um, there are kind of two parallel completing com complementing tracks, and uh, one is the global infrastructure. So there we there we try to improve the international data exchange first of all. Um, making sure that there are more and better products available worldwide, and 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 of course, last but not least, uh, better guidance and training uh, to the members. So, uh, in many cases, um, we see that the 
okay, uh, data is available, but users, uh, they, they uh, don't know how to use it or how to interpret uh, the data. So there is lots of um, need for the, for the training and capacity building. So this is the third bullet there. And then the other, other track is this um, technical support and uh, re regional or, or national uh, national intervention. So, so we, we really need to have a, a regional support system. So uh, it's not um, feasible that uh, we, we try to have a, each and every country having a capability. We need to put an effort on this kind of regional systems, which could then uh, cover also the individual countries in the region. And uh, of course, there are some investments needs, in the, needs to, to closing these, uh, these national gaps as well. Um, then, uh, of course, you need to know uh, what you target for. And then that's why we have then identified what what could be the priority hazards. And uh, um, um, priority hazards, of course, eventually need to be uh, decided uh, by each country. But uh, for the for the now short term action, we have identified that the, they are floods, droughts, tropical cyclone, thunderstorms, squall lines, etc. Et, et uh, as a priority hazard. So the, these five first um, um, uh, first top uh, top of the of the of the um, of the diagram uh, countries there defined in the in the red box. And this these are based on the on the results. So we have done this kind of survey, and uh, and uh, it's it's uh, that's where the the countries have been indicating that these are the these are the hazards they they are more prone to, and they, that's where they need uh, more uh, more support, more more capability. And as you see, um, there are there are things uh, related to lightning as well. So thunderstorms are there, tropical cyclones are there, and of course, in many cases. Um, Flooding is, of course, uh, related to severe weather and, uh, and the lightning as well. And uh, we we want to roll out this with the, with the least developed countries. And these are the first uh, 30 initial countries. Uh, we roll out this. And uh, as you see, most of them, they are in the, in the, in the equatorial um, region. Uh, so they are very much prone to these um, these hazards uh, I just presented. Then uh, um, we have uh, we have put together this kind of early warning for all dashboards where you have all the data available. And by the way, this is a public uh, domain, so so you can you can go to this um, um, you can you can go to you can see the slides before uh, afterwards and uh, you can see the link there or you can Google and you will find it. And uh, here, for example, uh, it's an it's an example of VC and uh, this page presents the detailed information, the capacity for monitoring and forecasting uh, in in the case of VC. And uh, you can see that. Uh, uh, in the in the bars, uh, we define there that what are the what are the ma maturity scores here, and uh, there is a color scale uh, which is then uh, expressing the degree of, of of attainment of the each element as quantified by by early warning for all uh, uh, rapid assessment. And uh, you see that um, in this case there are, uh, for example. Uh, the, the least uh, capabilities there in the impact based forecasting capability. Then on the on the data view, you see that there is um, um, there is a um, analysis of all these um, these priority hazards and um, and uh, hazards by hazards uh, and uh, and the different categories and uh, and uh, impact based forecast um, uh, roles and responsibilities. Um, hazards monitoring uh, capability level, uh, alerting procedures, etc. And uh, also there is a use of satellite data uh, for hazards monitoring. And that's, of course, uh, uh, especially in my interest uh, when I'm, I'm working with the space-based observations. And then if you go to and define the all data elements, and this might be in in interesting for you, is that the uh, you can also see that uh, what are the actually 
missing uh, variables uh, related to any of these hazards. So for example, you see there, and in, in the case of Fitzy, they don't have lightning detection network. So there is a missing variable needed to monitor hazards five. And uh, you see that the lightning detection is missing there. So I recommend you you to, to, to take a look at this as well. So this is our tool to, to analyze that the, how we go forward and what, what are the gaps needed in in each of those those countries. Uh, then, of course, uh, as you know, uh, space-based lightning detection is coming, and uh, there are already many capabilities. So here I I list uh, from our Oscar Space uh, uh, database, which is a WMO maintained database, also open for anyone. I I I, I show you the. What is happening in the in the in the space-based uh, lightning detection uh, now and in the future? So here you see first of all you see the instrument, then you see the satellite here, and you see them on the timeline. And uh, currently we already have uh, uh, GO satellites. They have a they have a GLM instrument, uh, Global Lightning Mapper, which is already operational and covering nicely uh, U.S. Uh, part of the disk. And then we have uh, also Chinese uh, lightning mapper uh, covering a uh, uh, huge part of Asia. And uh, uh, end of 22, uh, UMATSAT launched uh, the MTG satellite. It's still under commissioning. Uh, they have a lightning imager instrument there. And in the middle, you see the field of view of, of this uh, lightning imager. And of course, it's a geostationary satellite uh, standing uh, above uh, located above africa and you see that of course it's uh, it's really nicely covering uh, africa and uh, and uh, africa will benefit a lot about this um, this data feed when it uh, it's coming going to be operational very soon and then in the timeline you see also the future and you see that the that the coast program is covering uh, um uh, lightning detection until uh, 20, 2030, uh, 2030, 2035. And then also the MTG is going to be going uh, up to 2040. And uh, also Chinese uh, are going to continue this, uh, these capabilities. So this is a huge advantage, especially in the in the countries uh, which doesn't have a capacity to 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 run the, the national lightning detection network or they don't have resources for this. Uh, and it help it helps in in many ways. Of course, data must be in use for the user first, or so that that uh, uh, reflects to the to the to the uh, uh, early warning for all initiative. And but you have to remember one more thing. So space based lightning detection is not the same like ground based lightning detection. So there are many advantages on the on the ground based lightning detection net networks like. Uh, um, spatial resolution um, and uh, the capability to to identify uh, ground to cloud lightning, etc. So space based uh, lightning detection does not uh, cannot identify the ground to cloud li lightning or or cloud to cloud lightning, for example. So it's it's not really what I'm saying is that the space based lightning detection is not really going to replace uh, ground based lightning detection networks. So the the ultimate uh, observation is going to be, of course, the combination of these two, two measurement systems. And uh, I think that was almost what I wanted to say. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, documents related to this activity I just presented, and uh, you will find the links here in my presentation. And, uh, and uh, thanks for your, for your attention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And over to you, the diary. Uh, Chindima, uh, it's your turn to ask questions. There are two questions in the chat. Okay, let me check the questions. Uh, okay. so it's in the chat. Uh, yeah, there are two uh, questions for you, 
uh, with, uh, with respect to your presentation. One is uh, uh, by Zainal Kadir, a uh, question to Mr. Pajala. Can we get access to all of these data sets, especially geospatial your, your data? If so, where is the source? Over to you, Pajala. Yes, um, Spaces is uh, uh, are sharing um, uh, lightning detection data. And then also what we have, so the data policy and uh, uh, is is defining what what is in, in, in WMO data policy, there are two categories. So there is core data and recommended data. And what is defined as core, it, it is a mandatory um, for any any member states to, to share that data. And now recently we have actually actually defined the, the, the core satellite data in WMO data policy. And that is including uh, the space-based um, lightning detection measurement. So, so it's, it's defined as core. So if a national or, or meteorological um, institute have this, this uh, data set available, they, they shall exchange that, uh, that uh, Free of charge, um, uh, it, it, uh, according to WMO data policy. Thank you very much, uh, Zainal. Hope that uh, you are satisfied with uh, that uh, response. And then now, second question is from Mike Weiser. I think Mike is from South Africa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pajola, for a very informative presentation. Is there any improvement in the data capturing of? and warning predictability of positive lightning. Oh, and that's, um, that's a very, um, very detailed question. And uh, I think it goes uh, about my, my research at the moment. I'm not that, uh, that, that much doing in lightning research anymore. I think there are many other people in this uh, conference who can, who can really, uh, really tackle that question much more, much more than I do. So I, I need to pass that question to other other researchers in this in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one more question from uh, uh, Sri Ram Sharma from Nepal. We are looking forward to uh, WMO's support to recognize this date as IRSD. We made requests, but did we did not hear back? Is there any way to declare it as a lightning safety day? I mean, world recognized uh, day, just like uh, what is in the UNESCO calendar. Okay, maybe I will. I need to take a look. Uh, I, I see now the chat when I stop sharing, so I will take a look. I will. Uh, I will respond uh, uh, in in the chat. So I will do that. So we can go forward in the in the presentations if that's fine with you. Thank you very much. I think uh, that is the wish of all of us. And we all are looking forward to see this day uh, being recognized as an International Lightning Safety Day by uh, WMO and then uh, get it into the UNESCO calendar. Thanks a lot. And uh, are there any questions? Even you can uh, raise your hand and then ask the question uh, Verbally, any questions? I don't see any hands coming up. Uh, then uh, let me uh, uh, read out uh, a message from Daily. We will have a group photo during the uh, Uganda live session and France Brazil live session. Please stay for the group photo if you can. So that's a request from the Thank organizer. You.